Podcast. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast, with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome to episode 40 of The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors, with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. And in this episode, we're going to be talking about the different approaches to therapy and how that guides our work. Interesting discussion. There are so many different approaches. <laughs> well, Wendy Dryden, who's a really well-known uh, therapist, I mean, he's a CPT therapist, and uh, uh, is that right? I don't want to get that wrong. But anyway, I think he was, or maybe still is. But it, it, he, he went into writing books, psychotherapy books, and yeah, so that's what he's really well-known for now. And... Uh, I can't remember the title of the book I'm going to talk to you about, but basically uh, it was looking at all the different approaches of psychotherapy, came up, this is three years ago, 625 different types of therapy in the United Kingdom. Oh, my life. 625 approaches, I mean, different schools, however you want to talk about it. Um, and, of course, we can classify them in humanistic school, can't we? We can classify them in psychodynamic school school we can classify them in spiritual schools we can classify them in body oriented psychotherapy we can classify them in existential psychotherapy uh, and they all have different approaches and different outcomes now hopefully cure is the central outcome at the end of the day for all these different approaches um, one of the ways i want to talk about it is, is that i do all the assessments at the institute that I uh, founded and work at because I don't work clinically anymore. And so clients will come in for half an hour and then I'll pass them on to a third of choice. Now, quite a lot of clients, I, I would say maybe 80%, which is a lot, that's eight out of 10, have no idea in the different approaches. So they've, they've, they've been recommended because their friend has used the, the services of the therapist MIP and got good results. And they may or may not, and usually don't have any idea of the approach that therapists use. Yeah. So um, I think it's important just to say that and to say that different types of therapy, of course, um, have different models, have different ways of thinking. Cure, I hope, is at the end of the, at the, end of the day is there. Um, but there are different approaches. Yeah, it is a conversation I usually have with clients in the initial sort of, you know, chat that I have with them as well. If they, I ask them, have you had therapy before? And if they say yes, I'll ask them what, you know, what kind of therapy was it? And they haven't got a clue. No. I, I usually say, was it CBT? And they'll say, oh, yeah, I think it was that. Well, that's the one favoured by GPs. Yeah, that's... that's that's the popularized one for often I think you know there's more research into that methodology is economically more viable yep in terms you need I think it's 16 you can get 16 sessions and uh, it's, it, it, the research can make it more observable and evidenceable but there's, there's 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 many many other types of approaches and I think in certain cases much more suitable yeah. But the, the majority of, of clients don't know what no. what no. approach it is. It, it was no. just somebody local to me or hmm. no. things like that, but yeah. Is it important for them to know? I always tell them that I'm trained in transactional analysis. I always make a point of saying what I'm trained in because I think that is important. It's important to me. It's important that they know because I do do educative therapy so when i'm talking to them it is all ta based yeah that's transaction analysis i also think it's important in terms of ethics and contracting and mainly because of accountability so the client has a sense of you know your professional psychotherapist and a sense of accountability if there's something what they wanted to complain about for example yeah. 
yeah. you are part of a professional body that you you know you there is there is an avenue of accountability yeah so i think from that point of view it is important to say that that i'm a transaction analyst i'm part of the ukcp or whatever body you're part of whether it be acp ukc british psychological department or whatever um so they know there's an accountability pathway yeah i think contractually from that point of view and also if you want to use uh, ta from i say an ed educative part or whatever ever discipline then that's also something which would be perhaps important to put into the mix yeah so <clears throat> when you say that there's kind of over 600 and and how you know the approach guides the way that we work the, i i think there's there are quite fundamental differences in the approaches and how we work with clients whether it's directive or whether it's solution focused or whether it's like you say relational or whatever it is th there is a, a marked difference yeah some are far more directive than others yeah so client-centered client -centered psychotherapist for example would be less directive than a transactional analyst yeah and they would uh, believe in um how can i explain this if the core conditions are actualized that's empathy sense of mutuality, sense of unconditional regard, then through those uh, conditions, the client will achieve a sense of actualization and cure, if I want to use it that way, will happen. Now, that's different from the way a transaction analyst might look at things. Uh, they're much more directive. I heard, and we've said it many times in this podcast, that you like diagrams and you like... Um, and then TA, there's loads of diagrams. Yeah. Example. Yeah. So if you're going to use different techniques like that, then you're going to be more directive as a therapist, for example. Um, and also in classical transaction analysis, uh, one of the aims, if you like, is helping the person having a more robust adult, which means they act, think, and feel the age they are and a more highly functioning adult. So there's, there are different, I think, aims depending on what modality we're talking about here. Because, you know, it's like, um, well, let's take existential psychotherapy uh, that, or even gestalt psychotherapy. And I could talk about more of them. They don't necessarily have a personal model with that as its aim. Yeah. Or gestalt psychotherapy, one of the aims of sure would be around contact. So, for example, the person's more in touch with themselves externally and internally, then uh, that would be a sign of health. Yeah. So people have different, depending on where you've been trained and what you believe in, will have different ways of thinking um, and may certainly i think um affect the outcome yeah because i think it's important that it's a good fit for the client it, i don't know whether i need to take that back because sometimes the client needs to be encouraged out of their comfort zone maybe in a yeah. therapeutic way if that makes sense you know if like i'm a very logical person i like diagrams and things like that so if i went to a therapist who was more focused on feelings and emotions i probably wouldn't fit comfortably with that but therapeutically that might be of benefit to me mm. who's to say of course yeah I mean, you know <sighs> It's interesting if we go back to you know 30 years to sort of 1990s um we had what was called in the literature the relationship turn and that followed a big piece of research that came out um by someone called north cross uh and i don't know how many people how many therapist people 
were in their research. But what came out of the research was that um, the relationship between the therapist and the client is more important than the actual theoretical model. Now that was often quoted to me in training. And, you know, in the last 30 years, we've had a huge um, movement towards what we could call relational psychotherapy uh, as being the, and the relationship being the major vehicle for transformation and cure. Yeah. Now before 1990, 1980s, that was not, that was not the case at all. Um, you know, and you only have to go back to before 1950s, 1940s, and f the Freudian psychoanalysis uh, or Jungian psychoanalysis, where the preaching would be to keep out of relationship, not be in relationship. So we had a complete change about the last 30 years and a very different type of psychotherapy has emerged to where we are in 2022 where the relationship is seen as the vehicle for cure and backed up by research uh, rather than theoretical models. Yeah. So, you know, I would, you know, I would call myself a relational psychotherapist, but then when, then I expect a lot of therapists would say, well, I've always been a relational psychotherapist. So, or they might say, which relationship are we talking about? We're talking about the transferential relationship. We're talking about the relationship in the room. We talk about past relationships. Um, when people talk about being a relational psychotherapist. But I still think where we're trained and the training model we're actually trained into has, does have an impact on the um, so-called relationship between therapist and client. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. So, so... I can only talk about the training that I had, which is what I tend to say to clients all the time. You, yeah. I, I know a little about a lot of other ones, mm. but I only ever see it through the eyes of my transactional analysis training. That's right. However, if you, I trained as a TA therapist in 1985, and I think if somebody has said to me, you know, what makes up a TA therapist in 1985, it would be very different perhaps for what makes up a TA therapist in 2022. And that would be because the trainings that you go to in 2022 are often very um, a different style of training than 1985. And if we go back to 1960, when Eric Berner was the originator of TA came along and created TA, his major focus was almost like a CBT approach of, uh, as I said, helping person create a more uh, robust adult rather than going into the developmental history. Where, whereas the TA therapists today uh, are usually more trained into the relational working with the child eager state and the developmental part of transaction analysis. So what's the, best... the next big shift, Bob? Oh, I don't know the next in 22 onwards, I think relationship is going to be focused on a lot but i think we're going to have more uh talking on spirituality yeah move more towards spirituality and how spirituality plays um a big part in psychotherapy i think maybe the rise more of the embodied body in psychotherapy um and maybe also neurobiology and neurodiversity and uh you know, if we go even further, the, we're in the robotic area. We've hit the robotic era. So the part that technology and robots play in psychotherapy and neurobiology and neuro is another whole story. Yeah. We think spirituality is going to come more and more and more into it because um, I see that happening and I believe that will happen more. Even though I do also see as I've said, the rise of neurobiologists and neurotherapists. And so it'll be interesting where we go. Yeah, because it, I, th I think it's right that therapy and therapists do evolve rather than, yeah, I, being fixed. It's quite good that there are different stages that we've come through from 
the psychoanalytic sort of 30s and 40s through to the 60s and 70s and 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 beyond and 21 yeah 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 Mm. i'm glad i trained in the relational part of it i'm i'm quite glad i'm hit hit this part because i do truly believe that the therapeutic process is what leads to cure in a therapy room which is why I always say, you know, if it's not working for you with the therapist, don't poo-poo therapy. Try a different therapist. Mm-hmm. You know, that, that, to me, is really important. Which bit particularly? That people don't give up on therapy because the therapist that they're seeing isn't what they thought or expected or it's not working or whatever it is I think often they think it's therapy that is no good as opposed to my relationship with the therapist wasn't the right therapeutic relationship for me if if that makes sense oh, yeah, I agree on with that so um it's an interesting age we live in but I think that we are heading towards uh, you know the areas I've just talked about being important yeah Uh, but I also am a great believer in relational psychotherapy and the importance of the relationship the importance of the client and the therapist being the whole of themselves into the relationship process and also an awareness clinically what that means at a transferential level yeah yeah see I suppose you know the robotic era like you were saying and things like that and I know we have touched on it in past podcasts and everything but online therapy and text therapy and everything else you know my 17 year old son's generation will probably find that okay might well do I don't know it's going to be interesting you know if we go uh, 10 20 30 40 50 years where every um, GP of GP's uh, uh, surgeries around, which I don't think they will be. I think they'll be like portals and stations on computers. Um, might well have a three-dimensional, four-dimensional robot that will um, be assigned to talk with the person about depression and learn empathy. You could be programmed into that robot and various other things. So, where technology will take us is another story. That's a scary thought, Bob. <laughs> That's that's proper sci-fi stuff. That is, yeah. Uh, I don't think we're far away from that. About holograms, and you know, I was in Grand Canary in November, and I went into him my mask on, and I popped a hologram. So you know, what about our Apple watches and our? They've all got now. I've got the latest Apple Watch in front of me, which is the Apple Watch Seven. What has it got built into it? It's got mindfulness built into it. Yeah, yeah. But that's what I mean. It's kind of an acceptable part now, isn't it? It's yeah. 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 Do I have a relationship with Apple with Apple Watch? Yes, I certainly do have. (laughs) And you can program it to, you know, come up with quotes to remind me to breathe at a certain time, to you know, the mindful exercise and we can go on and on. So the use of technology, I think, is really important in many ways. Is it a secure part of a secure object for me? Probably is. Yeah. I love the way you think about things, Bob. <laughs> I know, I believe this is the way we'll go. And we're going to know more and more about neurobiology. In other words, what's happening up the top. I was talking to Steph, who really, you know, has gone into this a lot. She said she's quite happy to do a podcast on that. Yeah. Yeah, I think that'd be great because she knows a lot about it. You know, that's that's uh, it's fascinating, really. But I think there's more and more parts that technology will play. Now, I really do hope that um, that isn't at the um, sake of dismissing the relational aspect between two human beings. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's what my fear would be in, like I said, my my younger son's generation. Mm. Mm. And yeah. again, you know, the, the, the pandemic and all that that's done with, with, you know, the younger generation being isolated and working from home and 
missing out on lots of social experiences. I think it kind of becomes the norm to a certain extent. Yes, it does. And I hope these psychotherapy training, training programs do insist on a reflection and understanding of the self, of the therapist, mm. because there is a movement towards much quicker psychotherapy training programs within six months, nine months, weekly, and a movement away from, uh, I probably, yeah, I think this is true, I can, I can say it on air. I think a, a much more movement away towards not so much reflection on the self by many of these different courses. So, for example, you can do course, counseling courses in six months and get a diploma in that. You can, yeah, you know, go on many counseling courses where they don't ask you to do any real reflection of yourself and no understanding of yourself. Um, and I think those types of programs or that type of emphasis misses out on uh, the importance of knowing yourself in the relationship so that you don't merge with your client. Yeah. Yeah, and I, again, you know, I think there are some looking at the different approaches. I went on a training at MIP once. I, I can't remember which training it was, but there was somebody that was quite high up in, I think it was NLP or so, I don't know. Was a program, yeah. they, they didn't have a supervisor. It wasn't part of the... You, you know, it didn't matter how many clients they were seeing, they didn't have a supervisor. And oh, I can remember thinking... How odd. Yeah, what? Yeah, I don't know so about... Who do you talk to about issues that you're kind of yeah. involved in and part of? I don't know about NLP, whether it's NLP or not, but I do know that, that uh, different, different ways of thinking... Uh, means that some of these training programs are moving away, if you like, from uh, understanding the self of the therapist. Yeah, but okay. I think that's where I went to with the supervision. Oh. If, if you're not being trained, you know, on that part and you don't have supervision, it's literally just learning from a textbook type thing. Mm. This is a process, go do it. Mm. Yeah, that's, it's mind-blowing. It is. So that's why I think, I, I hope alongside the robotic era comes the, the emphasis more on the spiritual side of uh, uh, the essence of the, hum, of the human. And uh, I often think that our culture, culture is a spiritual wasteland. Mm. And um, I'd like to... I hope we move away from that. Now, some people listening on may not agree with me at all, and that's fine. And I still think we're going to see more of a rise of spiritual therapies alongside maybe the rise of, the rise of a lot of the technological input into psychotherapy. Yeah. Especially in the mindfulness area. I love mindfulness. Mm. Yeah. I also like a bit of mindset stuff as well, where it's kind of solution focused and goal setting. To be fair, it depends what mood I get up in in the morning, Bob, as to which, which one I go. Well, I want. I love gratitude. I love, you know, that sort yeah. of. Well, I was a teacher, a lecturer before I was uh, a psychotherapist. And I remember those days when, you know, in the PGC, that's postgraduate certificate of education. Uh, people talked about education in terms of generalists and uh, a generalist is something that knows a lot about a lot of things rather than an, an expert and the importance of generalists and the importance of experts. One thing I do know is the clients do want their therapists to be trained well. Yes. Yeah. Whatever training we're in. Yeah. So what's your thoughts on generalists and experts? Uh, well, people, nowadays we have the, the sort of, uh, if it's not too much of a paradox of terms, general term of integrative therapists. People call themselves integrative therapists. Well, actually, I often think they, 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 they really call themselves generalists. They know a little bit about everything and not much about anything specific. <laughs> and, um, and I'm perhaps a bit unkind about that because there's some very good integrated courses. 
Uh, it's just, you know, people often can do a uh, cause, a module here and a module there, and a bit out of that and a bit out of this, and then call themselves integrational psychotherapists. And I, in my day, perhaps I would call that a generalist rather than somebody who's been, you know, four years in the training of one particular discipline. Okay. I'd rather, and this is a personal view, I'd rather somebody was trained well in one discipline and have that as actual template and then go off and learn about lots of things. Oh, God, Bob, because that's what I did. I'm, I'm just curious well, about anything. I, I, I love transactional analysis, but I'm not precious about it. It's not that I won't entertain anything other than that. Mm. I'm curious to learn as much about as many different things to widen my own horizons as much as in the therapy room. So yeah, I've, I always refer back to transactional analysis. It's my foundations for everything, mm. but I like learning about other things too. Well, I'm the same. I did a TA training then an integrative training and uh, I've done many of the smaller trainings on the way. Um, I've done Reiki. I, I was interested in Reiki. I've done a, an online course at EFT and tapping. If, if it tweaks my interest, then I'm, I want to know more about it. Hmm. So I think it's all, but I would like somebody, that, again, it's a personal, personal viewpoint, perhaps to be well-trained in one discipline and then go out from that particular sort of, that particular secure base. Yeah able to learn about other things and then they'll incorporate that into their own identities as a psychotherapist yeah i completely agree i don't think i would have the confidence to hold a client in a room for 50 minutes without a firm foundation of something <laughs> whether whatever whether it's cbt whether it's ta yeah. whether Crystal psychotherapy, where existential psychotherapy, whether it's some of the body oriented psychotherapy, some of the spiritual psychotherapies, as long as you've had a good grounding, whatever good means, but a certain amount of time, yeah, you've studied that and been part of that, and hopefully you have an understanding of yourself, then I think that's a good start, yeah. And I, I think that's a really important message that the only way that you can get a sense of self and a good grounding is the process of self-development and time and i don't think you can do that in six months because, I, yeah. I i did my training with mip thinking there was absolutely nothing wrong with me at all and yeah, as I soon as i started the personal therapy i realized well yeah actually there are some stuff i need to work through yeah I think it becomes challenging to try and attempt to do these things in a short amount of time. Um, but as it's a very good question we said a long time ago, and now we're coming to the end of this podcast, which is where the world of psychotherapy goes now. Um, I've said what I, I think, and I, I suspect many people listening here will have their own different thoughts of where psychotherapy, the world of psychotherapy will go. I, I, but I really hope they don't we don't lose or people don't lose listen to this that psychotherapy is made up of you know human beings and a sense of humanity and that we don't lose sight of that yeah i just had a random thought when you were saying that bob that this this podcast could be played in 50 years time and mm. what will they think listening to the two of us talking about the things that we're talking about I think they'll think uh, we're very strange animals. I mean, <laughs> we need to go back to, I'm 71. So if I went back, if we went back 71 years, I know you're a lot younger than me, but if we went back 71 years, uh, we'd probably, we were way before the birth of a lace of psychotherapy. And a lot of what we're talking about, TA and existed. And psychoanalysis was still probably the dominant uh, models. And they, really wouldn't understand what we're talking about much yeah it, it, just projecting totally into the future will it be an unknown thing for two people to be in a room together for 50 minutes 
discuss well, it. We're, we're on Zoom, Ham, we're on Zoom as Hams. But um, you know, I hope I, I really hope that we'll, we'll, we know that we don't lose that aspect of what healing and psychotherapy is all about. Yeah. Maybe talking about that being on Zoom, maybe me and you should do one face to face. That I'm very much up for that. Over a table with a microphone in the middle, and we'll do it like the who was it? Used to, was it Griff Reese Jones and somebody else used to do it? And they used to talk <laughs> to each other. We'll do we'll do that yeah. one week. In the olden days. In the good old days, yeah, face to face. Thank you again so much for this, Bob. Um, I'm not sure whether we know what we're doing in the next. Well, podcast. I was looking at some of the lists and people have asked for one of them. Well, a few people have asked for is how do we how do we work with angry clients? Yeah. You know, that's another one. How do we work with delusional clients? I've got a whole list that I'll send on to you that people have asked about, and then we can pick. But if you want to. Think of where uh, next one, particularly for our fortieth, is it or forty first? Yep, forty one. Um, May forty one. Maybe working with angry clients is where we could start the next one. Yep, sounds good. Okie dokie. Well, too angry, Bob. That's one. That's one I can do. <laughs> You'll be able to talk about that. Yeah, I can, I can do angry in the therapy room. Right, <laughs> okie doke. Have, have a brilliant week. Speak to you soon. <laughs> yeah. Bye bye. Bye. You've been listening to The Therapy Show Behind Closed Doors Podcast We hope you enjoyed the show Don't forget to subscribe And leave us a review We'll be back next week With another episode